Good morning, everybody. Pastor Mike here with another Watchman Fear Bible Study, the book of Galatians, chapter 4. Let's talk about what may have been in your past. I know you don't like me bringing up the past, but just for a little bit. And what may be in some people who are watching, what may be present with you right now. And I'll tell you what I mean by that in just a minute. Galatians chapter 4, verse 8. Paul says, How be it then, when ye knew not God, this is talking about before you were saved, before God really began to work in your life, you did service unto them which by nature are no gods. What does he mean by that? But now, after that ye have known God, or rather are known of God, how turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements, whereunto you desire again to be in bondage. Ye observe days and months and times and years. I, notice there's four things here, and I'll explain that in a minute. I'm afraid of you, lest I have bestowed upon you labor in vain. Now, the overall um, idea of the book of Galatians is that Paul preached in this area. He established... Uh, churches, probably more than one, and he preached the gospel of salvation by grace. Grace is unmerited favor, the unmerited favor of God bestowed upon these people without the works of the law, without the works of their flesh in any way, through faith. Paul said in Ephesians, for by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. People like to boast about the religious things that they do, as opposed to what somebody else doesn't do. Things like, oh, I speak in tongues. I speak in tongues three times a day. How many times do you speak in tongues? Or... Um, I gave large sums of money to the church. How much money did you give to the church? Um, I read 20 chapters of the Bible per day, every day. How much of the Bible do you read every day? You see what I'm doing? There are people, and this is why God established this idea. He established this idea that we are saved. I'm reading Ephesians 2.8. You can read it for yourself. He establishes that we are saved by grace through faith, our belief in what God said and what Christ did at Calvary. Nothing more added to the salvation of God. Nothing taken away from the salvation of God. It is by God's grace, His mercy on us, and we didn't deserve that mercy. We deserve God's justice. We deserve to be cast into hell. But that's not what God did for us. He gave us grace, unmerited favor, through our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, our trust in the finished work of Calvary. Remember, he said, it is finished, period. The, the work of God's salvation in our life was accomplished by the Lord Jesus Christ. It is not benefited by any act or any religious observance whatsoever. It doesn't matter if you observed all the holy days, St. Um, Saint Mary's Day, St. Joseph's Day, St. Peter's Day, St. Paul's Day, St. Patrick's Day, St. Valentine's Day. It doesn't matter if you observed all these days, because look at what he said in verse 10 of Galatians 4, you observe days and months and times and years. Days, months, times, years. Four things here. Four this number four in the Bible, think gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. These, where they observe days and months and times and years, it is them performing works that they think or they have been told that in observing these specific days, like St. Patrick's Day or St. Paul's Day or St. Mary's Day or St. Peter's Day, You've been told that you observe those certain days, that you pray to that particular saint on that particular day, and that will give you extra benefits from God. It's a lie. 
The Bible doesn't say that anywhere. Now, the Catholic Church might teach that. The Pope might say that. A priest might say that. But that is not what God said. Paul calls them weak and beggarly elements. That is, those things are weak. They don't work. They don't do anything. They do not add any special blessing to you whatsoever. None. They cannot add to the work of God. Christ died on the cross. He said it is finished. It's over with. The work of salvation has been accomplished by the Lord Jesus Christ. There isn't any number of prayers on any specific day facing any specific direction with any amount of money placed into an offering plate. There isn't anything that we do that adds to the grace of God in our lives. Nothing. Christ did it all. And yet, people are told that, well, we know God forgives your sins. Well, he only forgives some of your sins. You must confess certain sins to the priest in the confessional, and then he ascribes a certain punishment to you, like you must say 50 Hail Marys, you must be on your knees, you must be before the holy relics in our church, like a statue or some relic of some saint who's been dead for hundreds of years. You must do this and do that in, in our church in order to pay for the rest of your sins. Folks, the book of Hebrews, I encourage you to read the book of Hebrews. I don't have time in this discourse to go through the entire book of Hebrews with you. But I can tell you, the book of Hebrews that everything, it outlines everything that Christ did. It outlines how it was a foreshadowing of what was in the Old Testament, the Old Testament sacrifices. And it plainly tells you that Christ offered himself one time only. He does not then offer himself over and over and over again as is believed by those who participate in the Catholic Mass. Catholic Mass says we must take the body and the blood of Jesus Christ and crucify it all over again in order to atone for the sins that you've accumulated since the last Mass you attended, right? That's what you're told. As a Catholic, that's what you were told to believe. That Christ's one-time sacrifice at Calvary in Jerusalem 2,000 years ago is not sufficient to pardon all of your transgressions. There must be a re-crucifying, a re-sacrificing of Jesus all over again in order to atone for your sins. Hebrews chapter 6, let me read this. Um, Hebrews 6. Verse 4, for it is impossible for those who were once enlightened, who have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away to renew them again under repentance, seeing they crucified to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. So it's, the Bible's telling you here that re-crucifying Jesus and putting him to an open shame they crucified to themselves the Son of God afresh. It means they do it all over again. And Paul says, I think the writer of Hebrews is Paul, but whoever it was, he says very plainly here that it is impossible to bring those back who seek to crucify Jesus all over again for brand new sin. Seeing they crucified to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. The Bible makes it very clear. Christ died one time for the sins of all mankind, whether that was sins past, sins present, sins future. Christ's death on the cross one time for our transgressions is sufficient for all sins throughout all history for all mankind. We don't crucify him all over again. We don't return to the weak and beggarly elements of praying on certain days, honoring certain holy days, um, praying to certain statues, certain idols. Because that's what he says. 
in our past, you may have been a Roman Catholic in your past. You did service unto them, which by nature are no gods. They're not gods. They're pieces of stone or wood overlaid with gold. But they're not gods. Let me read Ephesians 2, verse 1. And you hath he quickened. Christ brought you back to life again. That's what the word quicken. It means to be made alive. Who were dead in trespasses and sins. Wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of our flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace ye are saved, and hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. So the Bible's very clear. We used to walk according to what the devil told us to do. But now we walk according to the Son of God, Jesus Christ, his word, the word of God. This is the course that we now walk. We don't follow that which by nature is no God, speaking of idols, statues. We don't walk according to that course anymore. We walk in a new way, fashioned after a new life in the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's go back to the book of Deuteronomy. In fact, we're going to look at several places in the Old Testament how the Bible makes it very, very clear concerning the statues and the idols and the things made with the hands of man how that those things are not God and they are not gods they are not really representations of saints that people pray to I guess you could title this particular lesson why Roman Catholics or even Buddhists or Muslims for that matter why no one should ever pray to a statue an idol I met a lady at a conference in Dallas she was a sweet lady I loved her she came up to me and she said you know pastor Mike I just want you to know I've been watching your videos and I think they're great I think there's a lot of things that you speak about that are just dead on true she said however and she brought it up to me she said I um, I take exception to what you say concerning Roman Catholics she said I am Catholic I go to mass I attend the Catholic Church I believe in the Catholic doctrine and she says, I don't agree with the things that you say against the Catholic Church. And when I realized who I was talking to, I start sending up these flare prayers to God. Hey, God, I need help here. I'm in danger. Okay, Because I don't know what to say to her. I don't know if I should just offend her and go about my business. Or should I try to reach out to her and try to get her to reason with me? And so I'm praying in my mind, God, I need help. I don't know how to answer this woman the way you want me to answer. Remember, the, the Lord taught us. He said that we would be speaking before kings and rulers and leaders of synagogues and so on. And that we should not think about what we're going to say. Let the Holy Ghost speak through us. So that the words that we speak, they'll ne neither be able to gainsay nor resist. And so I'm, as I'm listening to her, I'm asking God, God, I need help here. I, don't, I need to know how to answer her. And so 
she told me, you know, that she was Catholic and that she had, you know, took exception to things I had said about the Catholic Church. And so I said, ma'am, I said, there's one thing I want you to do. I said, next time you go into your church to worship, and I said, and you see all those statues in there, a statue of Jesus on a cross, statue of Mary, more than likely there's going to be in a Catholic church, there's going to be a statue of Mary somewhere. It's either going to be in that uh, sanctuary area where they all worship, or it's going to be outside in a, in a garden somewhere or whatever, but there's going to be a statue of Mary somewhere, almost guaranteed. And I said, next time you go into your church to worship and you see those statues there, I want you to think of what is written in the Ten Commandments. And she cut me off. She said, I know. I know what you're going to say. She said, my priest told us that we're not supposed to pray to statues of false gods. And the Holy Ghost is saying, Mike, go, go with that. And I knew where to go because I knew what the Bible said versus what she was told. And I said, ma'am, I said, have you not ever read the commandment given to you by God? It says very clearly in Exodus 20, thou shalt not make unto thee any, any graven image, the likeness of anything that is in heaven. In fact, I'll read it just to make sure that I get it absolutely word for word, verbatim. That's a good Latin word. Let me read to you the exact wording of the second commandment. The first commandment, of course, is thou shalt have no other gods before me. And so I want you to think about the doctrine of praying to certain saints like St. Joseph or St. Jude. There's a hospital called St. Jude's Children's Research Hospital. The reason why it's called St. Jude's Hospital. The patron saint of that particular hospital, St. Jude, is the patron saint of hopeless causes. A lot of children go to this particular hospital to die. Okay? It's a research hospital researching various cancers and things that kill children at a young age. But more than likely, a lot of those children that go to that hospital are going to die. Not all of them. But that's who St. Jude is. The patron saint of hopeless cases. And here's what a lot of Catholics were taught. They're taught not to try to pray to God directly, but to pray to a certain saint, such as St. Jude or St. Mary. Because if you pray to that particular saint, then that saint stands as a mediator between you and Jesus, who is God. But you look at that very first commandment, thou shalt have no other gods before me. And you were taught that if you prayed to a certain saint, that that saint stands between you or stands before God and you. You're praying to Saint Jude, who then you were told prays then to Jesus who prays to God. That's putting another God before you and the holy God, Jesus Christ. But then we have the issue of statues. <clears throat> thou shalt not, verse 4 of Exodus chapter 20, thou shalt, thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image, any graven image, um, or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. So it doesn't matter if it's a fish, a whale, a dragon, or a person. The likeness of anything that is in the earth beneath, meaning, meaning beneath heaven, or the likeness of anything that is in heaven above. All of these saints, St. Joseph, St. Jude, St. Mary, St. Peter, St. Paul, St. Luke, St. Matthew, all of these saints are 
in heaven, according to the Catholic Church, and we are not supposed to make an image or the likeness of anything that is in heaven. So whereas the, the priest told this lady, and I believe her, she said, my priest told us that that means we're not to pray to any idols of false gods like Baal or Ashtaroth, right? But according to the scriptures, you're not supposed to carve an image of anybody that is in heaven or anybody that is in the earth or anybody that is in the sea. You're not to make a statue, a carved image to any likeness of anything that is in heaven. He said, don't do it. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them What's genuflecting? Genuflecting is you walk into the Holy Catholic Church and you see the crucifix. You see the images of Mary holding the little child Jesus and you bow before them. That's genuflecting. Cross yourself. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them. Serving them means you do what they tell you to do. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. And what you have to do as a Catholic, you have to ask yourself, should I obey what God said clearly in the Ten Commandments? Or should I listen to my priest or my bishop or the cardinals? or the Holy See, or the Pope himself? Should I listen to these men, or should I adhere to what God said? And God said, God didn't just say, don't make statues to false gods. God never said that. He said, don't make a carved image, a graven image. Graven means carved of any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or the earth or in the waters beneath the earth, period, which basically encompasses everything. We're not to make a carved image, bow down to it, and serve it, do what it tells you to do, pray to it. We're not supposed to do that. Let's look in Deuteronomy chapter 4. Look at the warning that God gave to the children of Israel. That warning is just as valid today as it was some three, 4,000 years ago. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 9. Only take heed to thyself and keep thy soul diligently, lest thou forget the things which thine eyes have seen, and lest they depart from thine heart all the days of thy life. But teach them thy sons and thy sons' sons, especially the day that thou stoodest before the Lord thy God in Horeb, when the Lord said unto me, Gather me the people together, and I will make them hear my words that they may learn to fear me all the days that they shall live upon the earth and that they may teach their children. And ye came near and stood under the mountain and the mountain burned with fire in the midst of heaven with darkness, clouds and thick darkness. And the Lord spake unto you out of the midst of the fire. You heard the voice of the words, but saw no similitude only ye heard a voice. Let me, let me finish this and I'll tell you what it means. And he declared unto you his covenant, which he commanded you to perform even 10 commandments. The 10 commandments were God's covenant with Israel. And he wrote them upon two tables of stone. And we've already read the first two commandments. That is, have no other gods before God. Don't pray to anybody before God. Have no other gods before God. Number two, don't make any graven images of anything in heaven, the likeness of anything in heaven or in the earth or in the sea. That's the commandments. And here's what God said. When you heard me speak at Mount Horeb, Mount Sinai, what did you see? Well, they saw smoke, they saw fire, they saw lightning. But they didn't see God. He said, you saw no similitude. Nothing that looks like me. So he says, take heed to yourself. Don't carve an image of me 
because you've never seen me. That statue of Jesus, the crucifix, how sure are you that that's what Jesus really looks like? That statue of Mary, how sure are you that that's what Mary looks like? The person who carved that image, where did they get that image from? Was it from a photograph of Mary? There were no such things. Was it from a painting that Mary posed for? Mary never posed for any painting. Where did that image of Mary come from? It came out of the imagination of the man or the woman who carved her. But he never saw her. The, the crucifix, that Jesus that's on a cross, or the Jesus that is a statue somewhere with his nail-pierced hands, the person who carved that statue, they never saw Jesus. They never saw his image. They never saw his likeness. So how do they know what he looks like? That's what God is saying. You saw no similitude here. You don't know what I look like. Don't carve an image of me because it won't be right. Nobody's ever seen me. Let's look at verse uh, 14. He set that up with verses 9 through 13. He said, you saw no similitude. So in verse 14, Deuteronomy 4, he said, And the Lord commanded me at that time to teach you statutes and judgments that you might do them in the land whether you go over to possess it. Take ye therefore good heed unto yourselves, for ye saw no manner of similitude on the day that the Lord spake unto you in Horeb out of the midst of the fire. You didn't see anything of my likeness. You didn't see it like a ghostly image of a head and two arms and two legs and a torso. You didn't see that. You didn't see my face. You didn't see what my hand looked like, what my back looked like, what my feet looked like. You didn't see any of that because I didn't show it to you. That's what he's saying here. So then he says, verse 16 of Deuteronomy 4, lest ye corrupt yourselves and make you a graven image. The similitude of any figure, the likeness of male or female. Jesus is a male and Mary is a female. And God said, do not corrupt yourselves and make the similitude of of any male or any female. God said, don't make those statues. I gave you my law. And my law said, you have no other gods before me and you're not to make unto me any graven image, the likeness of anything in heaven. And he said, you saw no similitude of me. Therefore, don't carve an image, the similitude of the likeness of anything male or female. So the image of Jesus, the image of Mary, the image of Paul, the image of St. Andrew, the image of St. Agnes, um, St. Elizabeth, St. Anne, who they say is the mother of Mary. The images of these people that you say are in heaven you don't know what they look like. You never saw their similitude. Therefore, do not make and engrave the similitude of any of these people. God said, don't do it, period. So, you go into the church. I'll give you, I won't just pick on Catholics, even though I'm not, I'm not trying to pick on anybody. I'm trying to share with you the truth of the word of God versus what you were told. I went to uh, a family that I knew, a uh, good family, good people, good moral people. They worked for a lot of conservative Christian causes in the state of Missouri and Jefferson County here and a lot of things, very, very active in politics. Their son was killed in a car accident, very tragic. He was in his 20s. And so I attended the funeral. They went to a, a uh, Lutheran church, Missouri Synod Lutheran Church. I'd never been to a Lutheran church, but I went to the funeral, and I noticed that on the stage they had the very, very large statue of Jesus sitting on a throne. And I'm thinking in my mind, does not the commandment say not to have a graven image of the likeness of anything in heaven? 
Well, that would be Jesus. That would include Jesus. They're not to have a statue of Jesus. So I'm thinking, well, okay, maybe it's just a, you know, a decoration of some kind or whatever. And then the, the minister of this Lutheran church came in from the back, and he's, re, he's walking down the aisle, center aisle, and he's reading out of a prayer book. So he's praying this prayer as he's walking. I'm going, okay, you know, we read prayers because you don't want to have to try to think of one. You know, maybe the emotions are too high or whatever. So he's reading this prayer, and he goes up on the stage, and then he stops, and he stands in front of the statue of Jesus, and he kneels and bows as he's praying this prayer. And I went, okay, I know for a fact we are not supposed to do that, period. We're not supposed to serve the statue. We're not to bow down to the statue, the idol, the graven image. We're not supposed to do that. Much less make the carving of an image of the likeness of anything that is in heaven, which would include Jesus, because we don't know what he looks like. We never saw the similitude of anything in heaven. Therefore, we're not supposed to have the similitude of anything in heaven, period. That's what he said. The likeness of any male or female, verse 17 of Deuteronomy 4, the likeness of any beast that is on the earth. They're going to make an image to the beast, are they not? Revelation 13, God said don't do it. The likeness of any winged fowl that flieth in the air, that would include angels. We're not supposed to have Statues of angels, period. Well, I, you know, I decorate my house with, you know, little angel, ceramic angels, little baby, naked baby angels with wings. Is that okay? God said, the likeness of any winged fowl that flieth in the air. God said no. Okay? I'm just going to leave it at that. You decide what you're going to do. The likeness of anything that creepeth on the ground, like lizards and snakes and frogs and I don't know what else creeps on the ground. The likeness of any fish that is in the waters beneath the earth. God said, don't have them. Don't serve them. Don't pray to them. Don't bow to them. Don't carve them out. Unless thou lift up thine eyes into heaven, and when thou seest the sun and the moon and the stars, even all the host of heaven, should us be driven to worship them and serve them. See, worship is serving them. Worship and serve them. He links it together to show you what worship is. Doing what they say. When he mentions the sun, moon, and the stars, the host of heaven, astrology. People look to the sun, the moon, the stars, and their position and what house they're in. And they serve that, meaning that whatever the astrologer tells them about that specific day, then that's what's going to happen. They serve and give obeisance to the sun, moon, stars, all the host of heaven. That's what astrology is. Which the Lord thy God hath divided into all nations under the whole heaven. God, simply put, God said, don't do it. And he made it very, very clear. Now, uh, next week, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to finish this. We're going to kind of get a little bit deeper into these other gods that God said don't worship them. Because we know that gods are evil angels. Little g gods in the Bible, they are evil angels, fallen angels you might want to call them, devils. All right, that's who they are. And for every statue that somebody worships, I think there is a devil attached to that idol. And so you're bowing before something, a piece of rock or a piece of wood, the stick or the stock, the Bible says. They worship the stock or the doctrine of the stock, which means the doctrine of idols. Now here's this statue. It doesn't move. It can't see. It might, it might do like this might be welcoming you but the truth of it is those hands it has hands but they can't they can't do anything it has feet but they have to be carried around 
If an earthquake happens and these statues fall, someone has to pick them up. They can't pick themselves up. How, how powerful a God is that? Why would you pray to something that's dead? Why would you do that? Doesn't make sense, does it? And you would say, well, I don't really pray to the statue. I pray to the, the saint that's represented by that statue. Ah, now you have the violation of the first commandment. Thou shalt not have any gods before me. None. God is a very jealous God. And he'll only tolerate it so long, and then he'll do something about it. Maybe. Maybe God will stir in your heart as a Catholic or as a Lutheran or a Buddhist or a Muslim or anybody who bows before some dead thing. Maybe God will stir in your heart over this and teach you that those statues, those idols, the Buddha, big gold Buddha, making his hand gestures or whatever, he can't do anything. He's dead. His image is wood or stone or some sort of metal. But he can't move. He can't talk to you. He can't see you. He can't hear you. Why pray to him? He's lifeless. He's dead. It would be like just taking this little mechanical pencil and bowing before it, worshiping. Oh, I pray to you, pencil. I'm not trying to make fun of you. I'm just saying it's the same thing. Even this pencil has the ability to do something, right? It has the ability to write things, write great things. That's done by the hand of the one who holds it. It can't do it by himself. So the question is, why, why pray to it when it can't save you? It can't even stand on its own. It falls every time. Something for you to think about. Like I said, we're going to get deeper into this next week. All right? Uh, in Deuteronomy, God actually said, these people who are telling you to go worship these other gods, I sent them. I sent them to test you, to prove whether you would follow me or not. And you know what happens? A lot of people, they fail that test. They're not going to follow God. They're going to follow their statues. And that can't save them, can't help them. I love you. It's the reason why I say things like this. I want you to think about what the Bible says versus what a man told you. And do you regard the Bible as a higher authority than man? I do. Which is why I don't pray to statues, and it's why you, as a Roman Catholic or a Lutheran or whoever, it's why you should not pray to idols. All right? I say it because I love you, and I want to see you in heaven. God bless you. I do love you. You're the reason why I do what I do every week for your benefit and for God's grace to be magnified in your life. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.